The story of the Biwathug nation is very much the story of European colonialism. The Biwathug were one of the first to experience colonialism and one of the first nations to become its victim. Little was ever written about the Biwathug, so their national narrative is nearly non-existent. Their entire nation had perished in just over 250 years of European contact. By limiting their resources and restricting their way of life, European presence was the main cause which led to their Biwathug nation's extinction. The final living member of the Biwathug nation was Sha Na Dithit, a Biwathug woman who was supposed to bridge the gap between the settlers and the indigenous peoples. She died in the care of the settlers, resulting in the extinction of the Biwathug nation in 1829. The Biwathug people were an Algonquin hunter-gatherer society indigenous to the island of Newfoundland. They lived together in small bands and survived the harsh Newfoundland climate by living off of seasonal resources from both the coast and the forested mainlands. Their inland presence kept them rather isolated from other continental nations prior to the European contact, but they were vulnerable to the latter. Only having contact with the Mi'kmaq and the Inuit peoples, the Biwathuk dealt with minor cultural influence from others. The Biwathuk as a nation truly arose in the 15th century from the merging from three separate migration periods. With technologies such as strong birch bark canoes, the Biwathuk hunted salmon and seals out at sea, while on land they hunted for caribou. With these animals being their primary source of food, colonial competition for these same resources were the root cause of their demographic collapse. They were an isolated and peaceful people when the Europeans came to their lands. It challenged their way of life, ultimately ending in the death of every single member of the Biwathuk nation. The Norse were the first recorded Europeans to visit ancestral Biwathuk territory. In the north of Newfoundland, in a place called Lanso Mado, a Norse settlement has been uncovered showing that they made contact with the ancestors of the Biwathuk nation around 1000 AD. Not much is known about their limited contact, but their sagas suggest that hostilities forced the Norse to abandon their settlements for good shortly after their arrival. These Biwathuk ancestors did not adopt the Norse iron technology that they brought with them, and stuck with their traditional way of life. In the centuries that followed, Western European fishermen often fished cod in the rich waters off the coast of Newfoundland. However, once Christopher Columbus discovered the New World, monarchs from European countries sent out explorers to claim these newly uncovered lands. John Cabot arrived in Biwathuk territory in 1497, which set the English crown on a colonial venture which never ceased. On his second voyage, Cabot brought back a few Biwathuk to England to show the king proof of his discovery. The Portuguese later arrived in 1501, and Court Riel captured some Biwathuk slaves and returned to Portugal. Described as savages by these European courts, this set off a slow ethnic cleansing process of all indigenous people in the newly claimed European territories. When fishermen who were exploiting the Grand Banks went ashore on Biwathuk territory, they would often capture indigenous people they found and bring them back to Europe to sell them as slaves. These fishermen were often greeted with hostilities because of the folly of their fellow Europeans, which led to violent reactions between both groups of people at first, with both sides avoiding contact thereafter. This early form of resource extraction led to the colonization of Biwathuk land. Settlement limited the Biwathuk and their capability to sustain their traditional ways of life by constricting resources and neglecting to realize the effects on the indigenous ways of life. Settlement began on the island as the British realized the benefit of having a base of operations for fishing and exploration expeditions in the 17th century. This incentive for settlement was to secure English dominance in the area over other European countries. Settlement began on the Avalon Peninsula, which the Biwathuk had abandoned because of the European fishing presence in the years before. Along with other incentives like converting indigenous peoples to Catholicism and trade benefits, the British were excited about settling their new lands. Both groups on the island avoided each other, which led to the Biwathuk's resources being drained by the European sphere of influence. As the 17th century moved along, the British remained in the Avalon and the Biwathuk in the Midlands. European fisheries continued to fish in the plentiful waters and came to land on the coast. This frustrated the Biwathuk as their land was being encroached upon from all directions. As settlements grew, colonists pushed further inland, exploiting the animal resources of which the Biwathuk now depended on. In, the, in effect, this decreased and dwindled the Biwathuk population as they could not sustain their traditional way of life. This competition for food continued into the 18th century as growing British populations was in demand for more resources, which limited the Biwathuk's capability to sustain a population. The Biwathuk would often retaliate by robbing trappers and fishers, often killing them too, which only led to further European encroachment and further retaliations from both sides. This context further spread disease into Biwathuk territory, which flourished amongst them, slowly killing them and shrinking their population. By the 19th century, the Biwathuk had shrunk to a minimum, a continuation of the same themes which hindered the Biwathuk's ability to survive a European contact had come to an end. Remaining Biwathuk, which the population had been decimated, attempted to assimilate into European culture or leave their traditional lands altogether. The Biwathuk had no known allies and only sporadically communicated with the Inu and Mi'kmaq people, both of whom they often warred with. It was recorded by William Epps Cormac, the first Biwathuk ethnographer, 
and by Sean uh, Diffit that the Beothuk were taught to cherish animosity and revenge against all other people, which was often reflected upon in their storytelling. This supports their isolationist practice throughout the colonial encroachment period, and why the Inu and Mi'kmaq often warred with the Beothuk. The Beothuk refused to trade for guns, of which the Mi'kmaq had plenty. This resulted in grievances towards their enemy, and only furthered their revenge against Mi'kmaq. Nonetheless, they did not have any allies due to the small population of the nation and their isolationist practices. They did not want any cultural mixing, and stuck with the traditional way of life. Prior to contact, the Beothuk might not have had an established trade network with neighboring nations, but rather, that trade was imposed upon them by the Europeans. Early settlers and fishermen did trade for necessities, and other documents show that the Basque fishermen often came to the Beothuk specifically to trade for furs in the late 16th century. Little is known of the Beothuk language, as it was rec only recorded within a few years before their extinction. In 1827, Bishop Inglis, a local member of the clergy, discovered a noun recorded in 1819 from a word list from a Beothuk woman named Demas Dewitt. It was recorded as beat hook, and was potentially what the Beothuk called themselves. A later study of the word was interpreted by Western linguists who studied Algonquin languages who came up with the conclusion that the word should be spelt as Beothuk. It was a part of the same linguistic family. The Mi'kmaq people called them Osanya. Linguist John Hewson in 1915 hypothesized that the Beothuk word has a plural and singular connotation. He also discovered that the term for a member of the nation, as well as the nation itself, was Beothuk. When the Norsemen encountered the ancestors of the Beothuk when they arrived on Beothuk land around 1000 AD, they called the indigenous peoples Skraylings. The names used by the colonial and settler populations for the Beothuk were Red Indians, Savages, Indian, and Red Men, until the term Beothuk came along with its many spellings. The red refers to a pigment that they used to paint on their bodies and faces from a red, earth-born ochre pigment used by the indigenous people for ceremonial purposes, but the true name of the Beothuk may have been lost forever. The Beothuk's annual ochring ceremony was a ceremony where all members of the nation would participate in the application of the red ochre pigment to their face and body to represent their identity as a distinct people or nation. The paint, remind, the paint would remain on their bodies for the entire year and would only be reapplied if weather conditions removed it. Babies born prior to the ceremony would have to wait until the following year to participate in this initiation ceremony. If the ochre was removed on purpose, it was considered to be punishable or a disgraceful offense. One could be told to remove the ochre, which was used as a form of punishment, to signify the disgrace that they had brought to the community. The ceremony was a part of a larger celebration that lasted ten days, and that included feasts, dances, and games. During this time of celebration, the Beothuk also applied red ochre to their canoes and other important material parts of their culture. During the winter, similar celebrations were conducted, where singing and dancing told stories of wrongs done by white men and the Mi'kmaq people towards them, and would include severed heads on spikes placed in the middle of the ceremony. Songs would tell stories of histories and courageous members of the nation, as well as settler culture. Songs would also tell stories of the nature and its wonders, which was used to pass on the traditional knowledge of the land to the younger members of the nation. The Beothuk Nation was a nation whose fate was secured before colonization even began. Being an Atlantic nation, and on an island in the middle of optimal fishing grounds, they were inevitably going to be a part of the colonization process. There was little the Beothuk could have done to stop an ideology firmly established in European culture and society. They were a victim of this process. Relentless expansion and desire for resources forced the Beothuk to rely on minimal food sources. Their immediate marginalization and neglect for their well-being led to the population diminishing and being unable to sustain itself. The contact they did have with the settlers only led to the spread of disease and the inaptitude of the settler population to realize their follies. Whether they knew it or not, the European colonial machine was committing an act of genocide against the group of people. Indoctrinated by their ideologies and about the New World, these settlers continued to wage an ecological war against the indigenous population of Newfoundland. The Beothuk people are victims of colonization. After the Norse left Newfoundland, the Beothuk nation began to thrive. With no way of determining the size of the Beothuk population, contemporary estimates reached in the low thousands. By the time of Shauna Dithit's capture in 1823, she suggested that there were less than 12 Beothuk remaining. Their story can be told from their perspectives because no Europeans cared to record their history until it was nearly too late. Outside pressures forced the Beothuk to give up their traditional ways of life, and they lived isolated in the interior of Newfoundland. With most of their archaeological sites located around Red Indian Lake, this is seen as their last stand as a nation. Being forced off the coast by colonial forces drove them into a lifestyle which was vastly different and unfamiliar to them. Encountering a European often meant hostile action as well. So how could the Beothuk have ever stood a chance against colonialism? The answer is that they couldn't. Too much of history was against them from the very beginning. 
Europe's need for expansion drove them to foreign lands. Their histories see this conquest as necessary and just, but when it is shown through the eyes of a small indigenous nation in a remote corner of the world, those same Europeans can be put into the same category of other historical figures who have committed genocide. That is not a good list to be on, but it is the truth. This is what colonialism can bring, the extinction of an entire nation. The story of the Beothuk may not have been properly recorded and is seen as insignificant to world history, but their story tells us what happens when colonialism is given a carte blanche in society. Death, genocide, and extinction.